I don't think I have to explain anything. It says it all up there. <laughs> okay, Michael, yours. Sure, 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 sure. Um, hey everyone, so I'm Michael. Uh, I work for the International Human Rights Organization, ACCESS, um, and I'm going to be talking about uh, threats to civil society, but also responses to those threats. And I'm actually going to try to focus a little bit more on the response. Um, in the past, uh, we've done this talk uh, at Ohm in 2013, for instance, and it was very much on threats, which are always exciting and always changing, um, but it's become more interesting, uh, for me anyway, on ways of building uh, response to those threats, uh, groups, organizations working together to have infrastructure to be able to um, respond to these threats better. So I'm going to be talking about these threats briefly, the rapid response uh, to those threats, and then some of the things that we're looking forward to uh, in 2015. So I probably don't need to go too deep into the threats that are being faced by civil society today, but um, civil society is always going to be at a disadvantage when compared to corporations or governments uh, in protecting themselves uh, from attack. And some of that is just based on capacity. Some of that is because they're focused they're non-technical civil society organizations or groups. Maybe they're activists, um, social, political, um, or otherwise. And they are not interested, or at least initially not interested, in digital security, but rather their activism or their work. Um, what we see is more and more, uh, and we have been seeing this more in the news as well, that uh, groups such as journalists, especially investigative journalists, independent media websites, um, all varieties of activists in all sorts of contexts, um, lawyers and others are getting targeted. Um, and what's also interesting is the groups and organizations and foundations that fund and support these groups um, are also a potential factor uh, for attack, but also uh, potentially as strong ally in providing this additional capacity for these groups. So the perspective that I'm going to be speaking from, um, wow, that's washed out, um, but is through our helpline, what we call, which is uh, three offices uh, around the world that focus on providing this uh, rapid response support, as well as digital security advice to civil society groups. Um, the oldest one is based in Tunis. It's been around since around February of 2013. Um, it's got, most importantly, one shift lead and two incident handlers. Um, then we opened an office in San Jose with a shift lead and an incident handler, and most re recently in Manila with a shift lead and an incident handler. In addition to those core staff members um, who are uh, available, we also have various support folks, such as technologists, uh, developers, uh, and a trainer. So why do why there? Um, part of it, or a lot of it, is time zone. So what we want to be able to provide is somebody who doesn't have to stay up the whole night um, and in a very unsustainable way provide digital security support to uh, a, a group or an organization regardless of what time zone they're in. So by being uh, in these different time zones, we're able to pass jobs from one office to the other um, during kind of regular hours, um, and hopefully that makes it more sustainable for us uh, as a support organization. In addition, um, it allows us to have language coverage in these different regions, as well as regional expertise, um, relationships with regional organizations, uh, and all of that. So, uh, what type of cases have we seen or in, on our helpline? So the, uh, through 2013, um, we had around 12.6 uh, on average cases uh, per month. Up to 2014, we're now averaging 37 cases. So what that basically means is we have more than one new case per day. And to be clear, these are external non-Tor exit node abuse cases. So we also run a number of exit nodes, um, and we handle the, the abuse of those um, as well. 
So cases are increasing. Um, our capacity is also increasing. Um, and, and most importantly, what I think speaks to the increasing case load is that our internal kind of workflows and processes are improving. So, you know, because we've dealt with problem X before, we can now uh, have a template um, for that. And maybe we've created a walkthrough or we found the appropriate resources that are online that are effective for that. Um, and so we're looking forward to further solidifying those workflows and then also making sure that those are audited with other organizations that do similar things so that uh, we're doing the best practice that we can. Uh, looking at these cases from another way, um, also kind of splitting it arbitrarily between the two years. Um, you, we've done cases in more than 60 countries. Um, the countries vary pretty wildly. Um, it's not as interesting data uh, as you would think in terms of the rankings because there were such a higher number of cases in 2014. Um, you know, you, know we, you, you could still have a, a greater number of Malaysia cases in 2014 as you had in 2013, but it doesn't make it to the top 10, that type of thing. Um, so there are a couple of different contexts that maybe uh, are shared between these different countries that we definitely saw. So presidential elections are definitely a ripe time for the targeting of independent media sites or activists, um, protests and civil unrest for sure. One of the interesting things is the uh, prominence of the United States. So in the US there are many international organizations that are based there that do work um, elsewhere in the world and so a lot of that work is actually helping these organizations such as advocacy organizations um, or other do that work in a safe and effective way that's not putting their local partners at risk. Um, and so that also speaks to kind of the uh, lack of depth that we've started categorizing things still. Um, we haven't differentiated those cases within the actual target countries. 2014, you have hacking groups, the target of LGBTI communities, and as well as independent media and journalists. Um, I'm going to take a brief look at Vietnam, just because it's a, the number one uh, country that we worked in for this year, and it represents um, a case that, or it represents a lot of issues that are faced in a lot of places, and it gets them all. So, uh, what's interesting about Vietnam is you actually do have access to Facebook, and you do have access to popular, you know, pl uh, platforms that are censored in Iran or China or other places. Um, but what that means is then you have uh, pro-regime hacking groups and other folks taking advantage of those platforms to try to target folks. So we get a lot of uh, account recovery or compromised accounts. Um, you get a lot of ab abuse of abuse mechanisms on these platforms. So one of the classic examples of that is a uh, real name policy. So this is something that's especially prevalent uh, with Facebook and for a time uh, was a significant threat because uh, if enough people uh, reported your profile, then Facebook would ask you, you know, for an identity card or information, and this would be likely an individual that's, you know, working under a pseudonym, and they would be thinking that they're authenticating themselves to Facebook when, in fact, they might be authenticating themselves to their entire network, um, which means they provide their information to Facebook, then Facebook publishes that new updated information to their profile, basically outing them. So that's obviously something that you want to prevent. Um, in addition, Vietnam's interesting because uh, there's a lot of infrastructure um, or potential infrastructure attacks. Um, on the website side, um, websites get uh, of like independent media and civil society groups get targeted, and so there's a lot of needs regarding updating, hardening DDoS protection, and there's a lot of existing organizations that uh, we can connect groups with, so such as Deflect, uh, Cloudflare's Project Galileo, or uh, Google's Project Shield, that all provide free DDoS protection to civil society. And then, of course, there's this, a host of other secure communications and anonymity uh, concerns there. More generally, uh, in the countries and communities that we've worked in, there's um, 
there's obviously a wide spectrum of need, but maybe some of the ones that are most interesting or most familiar to you guys are secure email. GPG encrypted email is still very tough for a lot of folks, and so um, MailPile is also obviously something that we're uh, anticipating greatly, but uh, we can't put all of our faith in one tool. Um, secure file sharing and collaboration, there isn't really one cross form one cross-platform uh, solution for that, unfortunately. Um, but there are some very interesting ones. So like um, BitTorrent Sync, for, for, uh, for example, on mobile is very interesting, but it's not FOSS. Um, website security, uh, there's a lot of targeting of websites because there's a lot of poor practices out there and uh, people have a lot of difficulty if you're a non-technical organization uh, in keeping those websites up to date, uh, let alone kind of hardened or secure. And so one of the big needs for a lot of organizations is uh, what's termed secure hosting. So basically a hosting provider that will proactively you know, make sure that things are up to date and uh, protect against threats that uh, are coming out. And unfortunately that costs uh, a fair bit of money for uh, and so are out of reach for a lot of these civil society organizations. Um, and then I already talked about real name policy a little bit. So what are some of the ways that people are, uh, that, the, that organizations are trying to support this work um, and try to improve this work? So uh, one piece of this is improving the workflows that we have for responding to these attacks. So um, uh, a number of organizations, uh, such as Digital Defenders Partnership, uh, Circle, EFF, Internews, and others, uh, as well as ourselves, put out a thing called Digital First Aid Kit, which is basically the first step towards trying to audit these workflows on how we respond to uh, these situations. But it's not just for the existing community in order to build you know, some type of general foundation uh, of response, let's say, to targeted malware or whatnot. Um, it's also to make it easier to build additional rapid response uh, groups and communities uh, around the world. Because what's most helpful is it's not one organization doing this, but it's a number of organizations at international and regional and local and community levels um, doing this work. In terms of uh, improving these processes as well, um, there's been the recent listing of a civil society cert to try to improve this coordination between the civil society community. Um, and you can check it out. Um, it's not accredited yet as a cert. Um, we're also hoping to uh, go through this same process. Um, and a lot of this is to help audit our workflows um, and help make sure that all the things that we do are our best practice and um, are easily shareable uh, publicly so that other groups can also build these types of infrastructure and support mechanisms for civil society. Hello. Um, so this is kind of zoomed in a bit, but um, one of the interesting aspects of the helpline work that we do and the response that we have is actually only 50% or 51% of our cases are reactive in the sense that someone is urgently you know, contacting us and they need X, Y, or Z done. Uh, about half of our cases are instead people pinging us, most likely um, organizations or individuals that we already have a relationship with from working with them in the past that are asking for proactive help to you know, secure communications in some variety or implement or try out some tool or, or have a training on a particular uh, practice. And so what this does is actually put rapid response organizations in a dif difficult position because they're nominally focused on this reactive type of support um, but in building these relationships with these different organizations or groups, you're, uh, you, you become involved in these more long-term, uh, basically, capacity building. Uh, and so uh, some of the ways of helping that is by bridging this gap between the rapid responders and the training community. So the training community um, are the folks that do this type of capacity building. 
um, for organizations and individuals. Um, but as of now, there isn't a great interaction between the two communities. Um, and so, for instance, uh, a lot of the materials that are created for training are targeting end users rather than targeting uh, folks uh, training other people. So a rapid responder doesn't necessarily have uh, a lot of materials in which that they can learn how to best communicate, you know, secure communications issues to uh, a given community. But that's uh, getting filled, at least at some level. Um, there's the Level Up project, which is currently being managed by Internet News, and there's also the Safe Tag pro project, also currently being managed by Internet News, that are very exciting. Um, level Up is focused on trainers and Safe Tag on auditors of uh, the security of organizations. So these are ways of filling in these gaps between rapid response um, and the training of end users and trying to fill in like, what about organizational level? What about getting more trainers um, that can kind of work in that spectrum? On the other side, trainers often fall into the, uh, an issue where you know, they're funded to go to a certain place and do a training for a week or five days or three days. Um, with a number of different organizations on a set number of topics. Um, and that's all that they're funded to do. Um, and maybe they're not even an organization, but a number of consultants. And so one way of helping support that initial interaction with digital security tools and practices is to have these rapid response responder groups supporting the trainers when they're going to these places and coming out of those trainings so that those organizations can continue to uh, engage on those topics if they have issues with their you know, uh, Thunderbird and Enigmail installation or something like that. Um, they'll have folks that have the capacity to you know, respond uh, in a meaningful manner and all that type of stuff. So those are kind of my pitches for ways of tying those two uh, threads together. On the other side, you also have rapid responders and developers. So a lot of trainers and rapid responders receive very interesting user feedback um, on these tools because they're working in high-risk environments with targeted communities. Um, and it's the type of information that a developer hopefully would find uh, valuable. Um, however, they don't really have the capacity or time to be going to a, a developer and trying to uh, formulate their feedback you know, in a bug report or multiple bug reports, et cetera. And so there's not a lot of capacity currently to kind of connect that loop. And so one project that's an exception to that is OpenITP's Secure User Practices Project, which is actually just one person. So um, obviously more capacity there would be awesome. Um, for the developers to trainer side, um, one of the things that we're looking forward to trying to do in 2015 is interact more with the developers of some of these secure communication tools that uh, are relied on by these communities and trying to, instead of the developers having to provide support for these communities, um, which you know, is great of them when they're able to do it, but also have rapid responders and trainers supporting them um, when they're interacting. So more generally, uh, I hope I kind of spelled out in a general overview the rapid response community and going into 2015, uh, kind of the continued standardization and auditing of the existing workflows that we have. Um, and, and part of that is also trying to get it more publicly available so that more groups um, you know, at a lower level can be built around uh, these, this documentation and these workflows. Um, continued to focus on uh, specific communities um, that are being targeted, improving these different interactions between rapid responders uh, and training groups, as well as these, uh, these loops with developers. Cool, thank you. Thank you, Michael, oh, here it is. Wow. Um, we'll be taking questions. Please, if you, as this thing is streamed, will you please walk up to the mics? Number one, number two, number three, and number four. And talk into the mic so we got it on the stream. The young man 
And number three is the first. Number one will be the second. Okay. Hello, thank you for the talk. Um, my question would be, um, are you self as an organization being targeted at times? And um, do you have any, um, like, are you careful about that? Do you have any operational security regarding that? Sure, yeah, that's a really good question. So um, we certainly try to take a lot of precautions in the infrastructure that we build and the practice that we have. So for instance, um, on the back end uh, for ticketing, we use Request Tracker, which can uh, be incorporated uh, GPG um, so that all the emails that it sends out to folks are encrypted. We have an encrypted Schluter like mailing list where we coordinate um, stuff. Um, we try to, um, in order to access uh, the request tracker in the first instance, um, you need to uh, connect to a VPN where uh, you're authenticated you know, via a certificate then you go to a website that's not publicly available, that's only available through the VPN where you're authenticated via a certificate. Uh, then you authenticate with your, your like, account name and password. So I think that's three factors. Um, so we definitely try to implement um, practices to protect this type of information um, and make sure that the trust that people put in us um, you know, is well placed. Okay, thank you. Um, number one, please. Okay, so um, the question is about the partner's need for secure file sharing. So uh, what about on cloud? Because I use it in my organization. It's not a frontline situation, but uh, I know the uh, security audits are badly needed, that, but uh, have you considered it and did you find it unusable because that was the prerequisite? Sorry, what was the tool? Just on, uh, on cloud. Unplugged. I've not. I've not played around Unplugged. with it. The Uncloud project. Okay, I'll check it out. I mean, so like that's one of the great examples of what we need to do is have um, some type or more capacity to be testing out new tools, um, and then once they reach a certain level of we want to be using them, then have them be security audited by the community, and then finally incorporate them into the workflows. Sure. sure. Unplugged. Cool. Thanks. Thanks. Okay. Do it sequential. Number two, please. Uh, okay, Michael, I mean, thanks a lot for a really nice talk. I mean, thanks a lot for all the work. Uh, I mean, maybe I'm, I'm not so much uh, uh, informed about access, but I was wondering how do you get your funding? And the other question was, um, I mean, most of the certs around, they are, you know, private sector certs or governmental certs. And I was wondering, do you find it easy to work with them? Are there obstacles that, you know, on the top of your list that you would like to see removed or? Issues. Sure. So on the first uh, ask, so we actually have a web, a web page on our website. Um, so our website's accessnow.org, and we actually have a funding page. I think it's slash about slash funding, and it has our funding policy as well as where we get all of our money from, like specifically for each project. Um, for the helpline, or for access in general, it's like two-thirds foundation and one-third corporate, government, and individual donation. Um, but you can see it like further broken down. Um, but yeah, that policy ends up uh, meaning that in practice that like we don't accept money from the U.S. government, for instance, um, and some other entities. And that just comes out of uh, our history. Um, we originally uh, were providing this type of uh, digital security support to uh, the Green Movement in Iran in 2009, 2010, and then we expanded, um, and so obviously in the Middle East, it's uh, in a lot of communities, getting US government funding is a non-starter. Um, and for the second one, for certain, I'm actually a terrible person to uh, ask that question. Raphael, who's sitting in the front, would be much better at answering how it is interacting with private certs. I don't know if you want to like. Okay, Michael, I think your computer is on 10% or something like that. At least that's what it says. So, hello. Um, I work in Luxembourg, National Cert there. So, that's basically, I'm, I'm helping also, I'm trying to help civil society to have, to improve our security. So, it's, it's not really a problem of, the, the most complex part to deal with other cert is to get the trust. And it's the other, it's sort of the same problem we, you will have all the time in, this, in such situations. So, it's not really more complicated with a cert than with any other organization. As soon as you have the trust, you're fine. 
Okay. <coughs> Number three, please. Um, yeah, uh, I was in the um, uh, 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 yesterday in room number one, Crypto Tales from the Trenches, where the journalists uh, talked a little bit about the whole issue of about using crypto tools for communication. And they seem to be running into a lot of the same issues that you guys are encountering when you do the work with the uh, um, people out in the front. Uh, are you connected to each other in a way? Um, because I like the approach that you're closing the link to the developers. And I think it would be very smart that you all sort of join forces now in the next time to come because it seems to be a rather big issue to come up uh, for many people. Yeah, I fully support that and I definitely want that to happen. It's just a little bit slow, um, but it definitely is happening. Yeah. Okay, there's somebody at number one, please. And was that a sign or, yeah, okay. Yeah, it's, it's not working. Talking to the mic, please. It's, it's not working? Ah, it's working, okay, no, thank you. Um, well, first of all, thank you for your great work. I think it's a tremendous um, help for many people. And um, I would like to ask a question about this um, United States on rank two or something. Um, you said it was mainly because they are working abroad, but do you also have, um, you know, um, questions about um, being more, uh, being at, um, targeted by um, Western governments? And do you um, deal with that as well? Yeah, that's a great question. And certainly. Um, so communities that are targeted by US. Um, so there's like, uh, journalists, as I mentioned, more generally, uh, lawyers dealing with topics um, that the U.S. government doesn't enjoy, um, activists. I think it's not dissimilar from the types of communities that would be targeted in, in the U.K. or similar. Okay. There's two more questions here, and this is Germany. We try to keep the timetables. So we'll take a maximum of three. Go ahead. Hi, Fabio from Global Leaks. Um, I want to ask you if it, it does happen for the kind of job that you're doing, especially on the preemptive uh, activities that relate to the training and the post-training activity, to work with, uh, uh, let's say, project-based initiative. What I mean, uh, with Global Leaks, but probably also other software, uh, you end up supporting a group, typically in a vulnerable society, uh, where it's not your main job to do the digital security training, but you end up often working with people that require to have the digital security yeah. skills. And uh, okay, we end up doing the training when it's needed, but it's not our job. And uh, what you said about the post-training critical points is exactly what we experience in several projects. So my meaning is, does it happen that when there is a, a project that involves civil society that uh, need to be planned, there are already a set of partners, you can get engaged for the training, post-training, and support for everything that relates to digital security. That's a core component of a project, uh, but maybe who is leading it uh, uh, doesn't have specifically that kind of preparation and especially that kind of uh, uh, organized stuff to do training and post-training especially. Yeah, so I, if I get what your question is, I, we would be more than happy to support uh, like an organization such as yours when you're doing those types of activities. If you want to coordinate beforehand, that's even better. Um, I don't know if any organization has a full, you know, uh, map of what they want to be doing, you know, for the next five years. So we're more than happy to provide that support as issues come up. So, um, you know, if it's initially localization and it's support on secure communications to talk about global leaks or da 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 da, da like we're happy to do it as it comes up but happy to talk more later if I didn't understand your question. Okay, thank you. Um, last question, hang on. Folks, when you're leaving, please, can you keep it quiet for the last two minutes? Go ahead. Do you have a, a model for letting people volunteer to provide incident handling support, similar to sort of like the, the Sandstorm Center where folks can be on call to provide detailed triage, investigation, that sort of thing? 
Uh, that's a good question. So if you're uh, volunteering for a project like a sec secure communications tool or anonymity tool or some other project, um, we're more than happy to interact with you in with that project. For instance, if you end up getting some type of emergency response that you don't have the capacity for, we don't currently accept volunteers for this type of work just because it's usually uh, rather sensitive and it requires um, it would require us to implement more, I guess, user control um, in the whole back end to be able to incorporate that at this stage, at least. Um, did you wanted to ask something before? Uh, and I've seen you, but... Thank you. Keep just it a short. Quick question. Uh, I just uh, checked your website, and I would be curious to know if you have been to South Korea concerning the ITU planetary session, and you had this campaign. ITU, that, yeah. Uh, and I would be very, uh, also, uh, highly appreciate if you could tell us more about was it successful? Uh, did you uh, achieve something during this uh, meeting? Sure. So, um, in addition to the technical work that we do, we also have a policy and advocacy teams. So that's the ITU internet governance stuff is more on the policy team. So I can't talk to that in particular, but I'd be more than happy to connect you with the policy folks that did go to South Korea and did work on that. Okay. Really last question. How do you raise your, how do you raise your profile and reach groups? How do they come across you? And of the, um, proactive, um, cases in which civil society actors sought out your help, How, uh, what percentage of those had previously sought help or support? So for the first one, um, it's through, I guess, word of mouth currently that uh, folks hear about us and uh, get connected. And there is a benefit because there's a implicit reference or referral in that. And so that helps us in the vetting process by you know, already having one trusted partner know this organization or individual. Um, but it is an internal discussion about what, how much more public we want to make it or, you know, have contact form on the website or things like that. Um, but that's kind of an ongoing discussion. Um, for the preventative, um, that's a really good question. I, th I would say the majority um, of preventative cases are probably um, folks that we've already interacted with. Um, who might have initially uh, heard about work that we've done from other folks or we've done a reactive rapid response for them. But uh, as you can kind of see in some of the stats, um, we're still kind of working on analyzing our statistics. So like I didn't try to look at that, but I'd be happy to look at that more and be able to share it later. Okay, let's have a final hand for Michael and thank you very much for that talk.